All right, good evening. Uh, this is Ryan Payne and Bob Payne. Thank you for joining our second video conference. Uh, we did one about two weeks ago. We got a lot of positive feedback that people wanted to hear more uh, information like this. And uh, of course, I'm here with my fireplace. My scotch is over here to give you a real fireside chat. Um, <laughs> or give you the illusion of a fireside chat. I think they used to have those back at Merrill Lynch, Bob, um, when they would mm -hmm. do these corporate events and they would they would talk about the markets. They'd have fireside. I remember that it was a thing back uh, maybe in the 80s when you were at Merrill Lynch. It was Lynch. actually more in the 30s, right, with FDR. <laughs> so anyway, um, listen, welcome everybody. We have a lot of questions to get to. And, um, you know, I think, to, you know, first of all, what we've been through for the last month was like a war. Um, you know, the fastest 36 percent decline ever, um, and then followed almost immediately by the fastest 21 percent rally ever. So a bear market and a, and a bull market in a period of two weeks, not to make anybody's head hurt. So you know what I'm calling it was a black swan event with a coronavirus, a white swan event with the unbelievable stimulus that um, you know the government has responded with. You know whether between the Federal Reserve and between the uh, central banks around the world. You know, plus our government, you know, we're talking about five to six trillion dollars of stimulus that uh, they fired at this economy and this market. And, um, you know, I think that's probably one of the reasons why you saw such a big snapback rally. But, you know, that's just going to soften the blow. Um, and I think we're going to get to the other side of the valley, you know, over the next couple of months. Nobody knows exactly when. You know, we, we hope that that was the low. Um, there's no way to know. Um, maybe it gets retested or not. But, um, you know, we've been through a lot together. And one of the things that I know that in my career, and that's over 46 years now, this is like the 10th 20% plus decline I've lived through. And 100% of the time, the, uh, not only has the economy recovered, but the market's recovered. So, you know, everyone I've been through since I was born, there's been 100% recovery. So, you know, it's never the same. It's always a little bit different, but um, we've got a lot of questions to address it tonight. So I just wanted to lead off with that. Yeah, great. So we did get a lot of questions tonight. So we're going to try to go through them. Um, you know, be very cognizant of your time. And we're going to cover a lot. We're going to cover everything from the economy, the markets right now, uh, different strategical things you can be thinking about, uh, and some tax strategies as well. So let's start it off here. Uh, so Rocco wrote in, even though most talk about a fast recovery isn't the long-term impact on the market negative given businesses that will never open and jobs that will not return, especially in industries like travel and leisure. Well, I think first off to address that, that's about 8 million people. If you're talking about travel, leisure, hospitality of about 160 million uh, person workforce here in the U.S. And one of the interesting statistics about all the stimulus is a lot of those workers that are on the lower end of the wage scale are actually gonna make more with their unemployment benefits, that additional $600 they're gonna get a week. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, a lot of these workers that were really stifled from the beginning here are financially gonna be in a better position during this bridge, which could last something like four, four months or something like that. So you know, one of the ironies here is that some of these people that are actually getting some stimulus from the government should be actually in better shape than like the Great Recession, for example, where you lost your job, um, you didn't know if you're going to get a job again, but realistically, when we get out of this thing, a lot of those people are going to get rehired again, and they probably can't even spend all the stimulus money over the next couple months. So that's going to be a real boom for the economy later, because that's a lot of cash in people's pockets that you just can't go to the movies right now or go to dinner. No, it's true, right? But I think the, um, <clears throat> let's face it, some, some businesses are going to fail. They're just not, they just don't have, I feel bad for some of my own friends. <clears throat> whose businesses are, are struggling right now. And, and it's, um, it's going to be very difficult. But, you know, the whole idea of this record stimulus, now we're talking about, you know, what would normally be five, you know, 25% of a normalized annual GDP. I mean, it's, we're talking about an enormous amount of stimulus. The whole idea of this to ensure that most business, businesses out there will have the means to survive. So, you know, one thing I know about our country, we always come back and, uh, and you know, not just the country, but also the markets. So I think that, um, you know, it'll be different. Some industries will be different. But, you know, America is all about finding a need and fill it. And some of these businesses will disappear. The need will be there. There'll be someone else who will find that need and will fill it. And um, it's just going to be it's going to be very unfortunate for a lot of small businesses. But, you know, I think that's what the government's trying to do here. 
um, and we'll see if they're successful, but I think they will be. So, you know, having looking at uh, that, given the fact that, yes, at some point we will recover from this, a lot of questions are around, uh, you know, what are the top five stocks you should be buying right now on a possible bounce in the next few weeks? Uh, what should be bought right now with stocks? Another question comes in uh, along the same time, you know, same time frame of that or same thing. Is there a great opportunity to take advantage in this week in this market? What indicators are you looking at to sell bonds, use cash to buy back good balance sheet companies? Uh, we'll, probably, we'll provide you a list of stocks and funds. We'll set you up temporary plan. I'm trying to read this language here. So we can take advantage of this, these difficult times. Well, first off, nobody really knows. Um, we don't know those exact stocks that are going to do the best out of this. Um, you know, quite frankly, a lot of that's already priced in. I'll give you an example of that. Costco right now, everybody's going to Costco. Their business is actually doing really, really well. Well, the stock's not really down right now. So if you're thinking about a magnificent recovery, a lot of that stuff is already priced in. A stock like Costco is not going to have a magnificent recovery because it never took a big hit. So I think one of the important things here you want to do is, A, diversify. Um, owning indexes, we prefer that to picking individual stocks. And really, the stuff that gets hit the hardest typically in these downturns tends to have the best rally. So things like financials right now and energy um, will most likely have the biggest bump uh, when things finally do recover. You know, one of the things that I've, I've seen in my career is when you have these big dislocations in the market, these big corrections, the former leaders are no longer the leaders. They sometimes become the laggards. So we don't know if that's going to happen. You know, over the last 10 years, you know, our large cap uh, growth portfolio is up over 400 percent because it owned the greatest growth companies in the history of the world. You know, Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, Netflix, you know, Visa, MasterCard. Um, and, you know, those companies did well because we had low interest rates and we had free money. Well, you know, what may happen over the next 10 years, it may be you know, higher interest rates and more inflation. So we don't know. And, and, and trust me, 10 years ago, when I opened your account and sat down with you, you said, Bob, what's going to be the best performers out of the 10,000 stocks we own? I didn't know, but I can tell you now in hindsight because, you know, we study these things. So, you know, the idea is that every stock's going to trade pretty much within their index. So don't make a big bet on, you know, any one company. I mean, look at Ford. They cut their dividend the other day. I had a, I had a Ford when I was in high school. Thank God I don't own the stock. Um, the whole idea is, is you know, they, the indexi, indices are going are to recover, and you want to make sure you're adding money to those. And the more out of favor they are, the better the rally is going to be when it comes. Yeah, exactly right. So, and that's one of the reasons or the cornerstones of our strategy is just diversify the living daylights out of it. We call it the all-weather portfolio. Because whatever happens, we're going to have money there. Uh, the next question that comes in comes from Nick. He writes in, hi, guys. When the 2008 downturn hit, my previous advisor said, don't worry. It's only a hiccup. That hiccup took 40% of my investment. Now, this seems worse. What do you say? Well, first off, um, you're a client <coughs> of ours. You're on the call. We always have a big portfolio of bonds. So, Nick, I'm not sure what your other advisor had you in. Um, but first off, you should never have all your money at risk in the stock market. So, you know, from an allocation standpoint, we're always going to have money that's not in the market. And just like the last three bear markets that I've managed money through or last two, um, bonds are the only real hedge that really holds up in these down markets. It's not Bitcoin. Uh, it's not even gold. It's a bond portfolio. So you'll never be in that position where you're all in stocks and the stock market goes down like it did. You know, right now we're living through it um, and not have a big bond portfolio. It's just a huge component to our strategy. Yeah, you know, Nick, it's really not different than uh, 2008, 2009. The only way to lose 40% on investment was to liquidate it, to, to make a temporary loss, a permanent loss by selling it. And in the balanced portfolio in 2008 and 2009, it didn't go down 40%. You know, equities went down 50%, bonds did not. So the whole idea is, you know, this is not 2008, 2009. It's not a financial crisis. It feels like a financial crisis. It's, there is a financial crisis being caused by a health crisis. But, you know, we're not, uh, we don't have banks, you know, banks are delevered. They're totally delevered already. All right. So we're not going to have the same playbook as 2008, 2009. What we do have, it's similar, is valuations are a heck of a lot better now than they've been in the last three years. So you're, you know, for an investor, your, your portfolio, your holdings have more value today than they did any other time in the last three to four years. You know, when they bottom out and turn is anybody's guess. But, you know, most of the damage has been done, in my opinion. And again, this is, this is very different than 2008, 2009. And, you know, the, the Federal Reserve, you know, what they, what they 
800,000, 800 million rye for TARP was what they, you know, was the stimulus they provided. You know, yeah, this they, is about four to five times. Yeah, yeah, you know, they just provided 1.5 yeah. trillion, and you know, the Congress just passed 2.2 trillion. Plus, you have the bazooka being fired by every central bank around the world. You know, the ECB, the BOJ, the even the uh, Central Bank of China. So we have six trillion dollars. That's a bazooka fired at the economy. Um, it's going to soften the blow, right? We just had really horrible news with unemployment. We're going to get more horrible news, but the market is a discounting mechanism. Remember, it looks forward. So we got to be smart and start looking forward and make sure we take advantage of this. So speaking of looking forward, uh, Joe writes in, is it time to put everything in cash and hold on the trading? And I would say a hard no to that, Joe. Uh, it's never a good time to go to cash because the problem with market timing, and that's what that is, because the, the thought process here, and I'm hearing this a lot right now. No, you are, Bob. Let's go to cash. Let's see what happens. If the market goes lower, we'll get back in again. Well, first off, the hardest decision to make when you go to cash is when do you actually get back in? Because the market does go lower here. The news is only going to get worse. Um, everyone in the media is going to be telling you it's apocalypse now. It's going to be very, very hard to pull that trigger. And that's only assuming if the market goes down from here. We don't really know that. Uh, if we really knew that, we make this joke a lot, we'd be on our yacht. We don't know that. Uh, the other thing is market timing is treacherous because if you think about it over the last 10 years, um, if you miss the best 10 days of trading, only 10 days in a 10 year span, you lost all your return in stocks. So if you know when those 10 days are gonna be great, but to be out of the market waiting for one of those 10 days to happen is a tremendous risk. So we always wanna keep our position in the market. Well, I think if, I guess the best lesson you can learn is from history. In March of 2009, the last bear market bottomed and the news didn't get better until July. The actual the recession didn't end until August. So while we were trying to get you invested and ourselves invested, um, you know, everybody kept saying, but Bob, bankruptcies are going up, earnings are going down, companies are failing. You know, the unemployment number is going through the roof. Yeah, it was, but the market discounts that. So, you know, hey, there's gonna be a tremendous value between you know, somewhere between 21,000 where we are now and zero. And I get this question all the time, Bob, will I lose all my money? Is the market gonna go to zero? And, you know, I always hope that it will one time in my career. I would just like to be able to have and own the entire country at no cost. You know, I always figure, I always talk to clients about this. I say, well, you know, what building would you get? You know, if the market went to zero, which building would you take? I'd take Madison Square Garden, right? What would you take? Man, oh, man. I don't know. I would take, yeah, I would take the biggest uh, real estate uh, firm in the world and get all their holdings, Bob. I'm, you know, I'm greedy. I think everybody just forgets that these paper assets are backed by real assets. And, you know, that there's, there's no way the market will ever go to zero. Um, and that's why we just have between now and whatever the bottom is, there's good, you know, I think there's better, greater, great value here right now. Best the buying opportunity we've had, you know, in three, four years. Yeah. And just another point on that too, is you remember your investments pay cash flow, And I always like it into real estate. If you had a great portfolio of real estate that paid you all these great rents and the price of those, those buildings was down, um, because that area of, I don't know, let's say in Brooklyn somewhere was just not the most favorable area, but you knew in 10 years it's going to be a great area to be. In the meantime, you're getting paid. You wouldn't rush to the market to sell your properties while the prices were low. Um, so same thing with your stocks. Right now, you're getting a lot of great cash flow, which actually goes into our next question here. Uh, this is from John. What do you tell your older clients? My wife and I are 66 and 67, respectfully. Bob doesn't like to be called old, so I don't you think that's older. an older client. It's older. Okay. We worked a lifetime for our savings and want to know if we're going to be okay. Uh, well, first off, you're kind of ours. You know, we run those projections for you and we'll do it on demand. Let's look at what you're spending right now, what you're going to need, and then let's look at what your portfolio generates because that's one of the key here is your portfolio, regardless if the market's up or down, it's paying you a lot of nice current income on those stocks are paying dividends, on the bonds are paying interest. And if you needed more cash, you know, our bond prices right now, a lot of them are trading at profits. So things in your portfolio, you can sell at a profit right now to essentially uh, you know, help you with your lifestyle if you need be. Well, I think the, the whole idea of investing is you know, for retirement to hit your goals, whether it's educating children or grandchildren or giving money to charity or just supporting your, you and your family in retirement. The, you know, the biggest risk to you right now isn't the coronavirus volatility of the stock market. The biggest risk we all have and we all always have is inflation. It's hidden, it's insidious. And something that 
we need equities as the only investment that overcomes inflation over time. Bonds are great. Bonds are great. Give us stability, give us income, give liquidity. Um, had a client last week, had an opportunity to buy a business, was able to borrow against his portfolio in order to buy a business. It's, it's great to have that stability, but we need equities. So it's, um, you know, you need the right balance. You know, you only need to take as much risk as possible as you need. It's not about, you know, all or none. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So going on the same line here, financial planning, Elizabeth writes in, just, as, in, just interested in understanding what you consider to be a risk-free investment. If your mom was 65, young, of course, and, and had about 2.5 million in the market, about 600K in real estate, she gets about 2,300 a month from a pension. Is it possible for her to be able to live on that the rest of her life? She has the longevity gene on that. Well, first off, you have 2.5 million in the market. What I would ask is what kind of income is it generating? You know, it goes back to the same question um, because basically if you have a diversified portfolio that has bonds, that's diversified over all different markets, you can generate a lot of current income on that portfolio. I don't know if that 600K in real estate is the house she's living in, you might not be able to generate income on that. Um, but yeah, that's where you want to run those projections. And to Bob's point, your mother's biggest risk and all of our biggest risks are the fact that things are going to cost more in the future. So you got to account for not only what her expenses are today, but what are things going to cost for her when she's 75 and 85 when things cost you know, double what they cost today? Yeah, that's, that's so true, Ryan. I mean, when I, when I think about what Elizabeth is asking, she's asking for an A to B projection for her mom. We need more details. We need to know how much money she needs to live on. Hey, I talk to clients every day, you know, have this same, you take the same situation. And I have some clients, they live well within their means. Matter of fact, they don't spend all the money we generate and they reinvest it. On the other hand, I've had clients who spend twice as much as the portfolio generates. And you want to know why their portfolio keeps going down. So everybody's unique. You know, we're all unique individuals and, um, you know, you need a unique strategy for you, but it all has to be diversified, has to be balanced and you have to keep patient and you know, keep calm through these markets. Yes, the next, next question comes in from Jim. Jimmy writes in, Bob and Ryan, I'm 68 and retired. With the available cash in my IRA, would you suggest that I buy an S&P 500 ETF or good quality dividend paying stocks like Wells Fargo, AT&T, et cetera? Well, all those stocks are first off in the S&P 500. And I would even say not even not, even not owning individual stocks because any stock can go to zero. Um, even in this market, good blue chip companies are getting hammered. And if you're, you know, in your retirement account, you're close to retirement or retired now, you are retired now. In this case, Jim, it's very risky to play just individual stocks. And even on just the S&P 500, it's not real diversification. A lot of us forget, but from 2000 to 2010, if you own the S&P 500, you made no money for a whole decade. And this is one of the reasons why in our portfolios, we own a lot of different markets because things change and whatever's hot right now isn't always going to be the best place to be. And Jim, you got to have some bonds in your portfolio. I mean, look what just happened with the market in the matter of, you know, literally 30 days. Um, you can't have everything at risk in the markets. No, so, I mean, I really don't have much to add there, Ryan. I mean, my, my only opinion is when, when you have 10,000 companies you can invest in globally, why limit yourself to 500? That's right. Uh, next question comes in from John. Do you foresee any changes to traditional financial strategies should this virus become seasonal and reoccurring? I would say no here, Bob. Uh, the whole idea of our strategy is regardless of what happens, you have a discipline that you implement uh, that really is emotionless to whatever's happening with regards to all different changes that are gonna have in the economy. Um, you know, just over our lifetimes, like how many different things have changed and our asset allocation strategy has always worked. Yeah, and I think that's the problem with the media. And <clears throat> when you have situations like this, they just play on your, your emotions and, you know, just keep telling you, well, things are bad, but they're going to get worse. You know, they, I've never watched the, the, the news where they tell me it's going to get better. Um, so yeah, there's, there's always headwinds. There's always going to be challenges, but you know, you look at the history of our country and we've had, you know, wars, depressions, recessions. I mean, this is the fifth or sixth virus that, you know, I never heard of in my lifetime. And the Dow managed to go from 66 to 29,500 over the last hundred years. So, you know, I think that this too shall pass. And, um, we can't really worry about things we can't control. We can only worry about the things we can control. And, and that's how we, we handle our portfolios. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, next question kind of playing into that as well is just asking about our strategy. Uh, what signs did you see that changed your position about investing this week? What changed from the prior week when a significant move had already occurred? 
through. I feel like that's been every week first off. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of our strategy is we don't have to know the future. Um, everyone on CNBC, Fox Business, I'm guilty of this too, um, <laughs> love to tell you they know. Um, they love to tell you when the bottom's going to be. We're going to have a double bottom. And I mean, I listen to some of these shows all day and I want to cry by the end of the day. And, you know, they don't know. Okay. First off, they don't know. And that's the beauty of an asset allocation because let's just say you're 50% in stocks, you're 50% in bonds. And to your point, you know, a week ago, the market went down. Well, now maybe you're 45% in stocks. And a lot of you've gotten calls from your advisors saying, hey, let's take some money from bonds. Let's add to the market while it's down. Um, what's never going to change is our strategy. But when the market changes, we readjust our portfolios accordingly. And I think that's crucial because it's completely unemotional. You know, I think the other thing is, I think, and everybody should realize that it's just not the health crisis. We also, we had really two terrible events that, you know, that are causing this recession. I really believe we're in a recession right now. I mean, it's, we're going to be when you see the numbers. But we had the virus come out of nowhere, coupled with a price war between Russia and the Soviet Union you know, which has driven oil down to levels that we haven't seen in a long time. So, you know, I think that, that the thing about this, this health um, issue is that it's going to give our government coverage to do the right thing for a change, right? So they're, they were able to pass that, that bill, you know, to get $2.2 trillion in stimulation. And, and the government's going to do everything they can to get us out of this recession. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why when you see the news, just realize that it's different this time because there's an enormous amount of stimulus, you know, to try and, and make sure they soften the blow as much as they can. And once this thing recovers, you know, once we have a, you know, whatever the, the end of this is, that stimulus is going to cause the financial markets to go up on a rocket ship. Yeah, exactly right. It's going to be rocket fuel on the other side is one of the things we've been saying a lot. And it goes into our next question. I think it plays into it really nicely. Uh, from Brian, he writes in commodities, particularly gold, oil, silver have fluctuated significantly during the past two weeks. How do we benefit as prices rise and fall? Well, short term, your guess is as good as mine. Bob and I follow every, every strategist out there, every trader, and they're not making money right now, by the way. They can't make money in this market because it's just too hard to trade. But when you start talking about things like hard assets, and we have them in our portfolio, and they've done nothing for a decade, which makes them very painful to own. But what you have right now is, and Bob just mentioned this, you have governments around the world that are stimulating their economies. Um, they're throwing the kitchen sink at this. And in the U.S., with $2 trillion now being spent from, uh, from a fiscal standpoint, that could be a real problem for the dollar later. Anytime historically you've seen the government unleash this kind of power, and World War II is a good example of that, um, it's pushed inflation up eventually. And when you start looking at hard assets like commodities, and then asset or commodity-based economies like emerging markets, they benefit from that. So I don't think it's a bad thing to have in your portfolio right now. In our portfolios, we do have this, is have inflationary assets. Because when this is all said and done, it's very, very likely we're going to have some real inflation, which we haven't had for a decade. Yeah, for a lot of you who have been with us for a long time, you know, 2000 to 2010, we had, you know, an inflationary environment where commodities did well. Um, you know, non-U.S. stocks did well. The S&P 500, as Ryan mentioned, returned zero for 10 years, you know, on, a, on an average annual return. So we don't know if the next 10 years is going to be like the last 10 years or the 10 years before that. That's why we diversify the way we do, and we're going to adjust accordingly. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing some inflation, some higher interest rates down the, down the road. But whatever happens is we're going to adjust accordingly. That's That's why you don't have all your eggs in one basket. You have your you have a basket with lots of different eggs. Which uh, goes to the next question, talking about all those eggs, Bob. Uh, Bernice writes in, same thing, considering the crazy economy that we found ourselves in today, with no good prediction how long it will last, I wish I knew, would it be prudent to add gold to one's portfolio, knowing each portfolio has different needs? If yes, how much would be safe amount to consider? Again, in your client of ours, we have a commodity portfolio, which has gold in there, precious metals in general. We have oil. Um, we have livestock, so it has really, really a lot of diversified commodities. We wouldn't make a bet on any specific commodity, but that is definitely a part of our portfolio, part of our asset allocation. Um, the next question kind of plays into that as well. What's the best investment strategy to bet against the dollar? I want to invest in companies outside the U.S. because I fear the dollar is going to lose its status as a reserve currency. Well, I don't know if that's going to happen, but again, I mean, owning in our portfolio, we own international securities. And they do benefit from a weak dollar because they're owned in those domestic currencies. And again, that's where commodities come in play as well. If the dollar weakens, 
that's actually very good for commodity prices because commodities are bought in US dollars. And because of that, when the price goes down, uh, other countries can afford more commodities and that tends to push the price of commodities up. Yeah, that's always the hard thing. It's, you know, it's hard not to predict which way the stock market's going and, and it's even more difficult to predict which way interest rates are going. But if you really want to create an ulcer, try to predict <laughs> currency direction. Um, we've had a strong dollar for a long time. It makes sense. We're the greatest country in the world. And, and you know, you would think that money's going to keep pouring into the dollar, but the dollar's been weakening here lately. So, you know, you don't know and nobody knows. And, and anybody tries to head that bet, good luck. And, you know, it will benefit us if the dollar goes down. Um, but, you know, I was like Larry Kudlow when he was on CNBC. Now he's in Washington. He always talked about King Dollar. And, you know, when it was going against my portfolio, I used to yell at the TV screen, stop talking about the king dollar, let it go down. You know, so it's, you know, some of these things we can't control, we don't want to control, we want to make sure that our portfolio benefits no matter what happens. Um, Bob, you shouldn't yell at the TV, it's not good for your health. <laughs> I uh, know. Next question here. Well, this is what these markets do to me, son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question comes in from Tommy. I know there are differences between a bond and bond fund. We've talked a lot about that. There was actually a question in the chat section here, which we're not addressing tonight, but you know, bond funds did get hit very hard here, but the institutional bond portfolios that we own have held up a lot better right now. That's why we don't like bond funds. High quality bonds have done much better in this market environment. Just a side there. But his question here is they kind of sound the same, but what are the differences between a value stock and a growth stock? Bob, I'll give that one to you. Well, it's pretty simple. You know, growth stocks are companies that, you know, are growing their earnings more rapidly. They typically don't pay a dividend or they pay very little bit of a dividend where value stock is something where, you know, you think of a, a big a value company has been around for a while. They got a moat around their business. They don't grow really very fast, but you know, they're not a company that's going to have a lot of competition because of that moat that I spoke of. Typically they pay a dividend. So when you think of, you know, value stocks, you think of financial companies and energy companies, insurance companies, you think of growth stocks, you know, you think of companies like Apple and Google and Facebook. Um, again, last 10 years, growth has been king. We made more money in growth you know, than we did in value. But, you know, the other thing people fail to realize is that we made a lot of money in value too. So value's done what it's normally done. It's done, the average been a really good return the last 10 years. Growth has just been incredibly good, yeah. but because low interest rates, free money. Now that could change, but uh, we're not going to, you know, make a big bet either way. We're going to make sure that we own, you know, what does the best. And that's why we break these portfolios down is because as value lagged in the last couple of years, just like it did in you know in the 90s we added to that when it was out of favor to bring our values back up and then when it does outperform you have more shares and that's where the leverage comes from remember wealth creation isn't about you know having you know it, it isn't about owning it. it's about owning the most shares when something goes up so the more shares you own of something you know the more you make so these dislocations are opportunities you know to acquire i think wealth creation is about share accumulation you know, I learned that, right when I worked for Merrill Lynch, the CEO of Merrill Lynch had the same relative performance as I did in my stock. And I kept asking, how come you have more millions than I have shares? I mean, you know, how, how dumb was I? <laughs> you only had more shares. You only had, yeah, more I had, shares. I had more shares. So. <laughs> um, so let's move to, we have a couple questions on bonds. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit. Paul writes in, I know many triple B rated investment grade individual bonds. Excuse me, I own many. With the present financial crisis, how will I know that none of them will default on the bond interest payments? Well, if you're a client of ours, and I think you are here, Paul, and there are some triple B rated bonds, which are investment grade, by the way, that's not a junk bond per se, but you're getting close. And one of the reasons why we use an institutional manager is because they do their own research. So any bond that you own, they're not just relying on what the rating agency is saying. Uh, there is actually someone vetting those bonds to make sure they're self safe. Now, why this is really, really important right now is because if any of you out there and you're not one of our clients own bond funds, we don't like bond funds, we talk about it ad nauseum, is they own a lot of low quality paper. And when we saw the bond market collapse for a short period last week, you saw a lot of those low quality bonds start trading down big. Now, a lot of stuff is risen again in value because basically the Fed came in and it provided liquidity to that market. But right now, more than ever, it's really, really important that you have someone who's doing an analysis on your bonds. And if you own a bond fund, you have no idea what you own inside there. It's like those uh, old commercials. You know what's in your wallet. You know what's in your bond fund. You probably don't. So 
it's okay to own some triple B bonds as long as you have someone who's doing the research and monitoring that because credit quality is going to change. And right now it's more critical than ever. In fact, if you're a client right now, you might have noticed we changed your money market fund last week um, to a treasury money market fund just because we wanted it backed by the government uh, or backed by U.S. treasuries as opposed to any other sort of debt right now. Because back in the financial crisis, some money market funds actually broke a buck, I meaning you could have lost money in a money market fund. So you want to take all the precautions right now to make sure everything you own is of the highest quality and someone's doing research. Can't emphasize that enough. You know, Ryan, it's real simple. You know, on the bond portfolio, it's not about the return on your money, it's return of your money. Um, it's a safe part of your portfolio. And if you're out there investing with, you, with a stockbroker buying bonds based on how they're rated, no stockbroker has the ability to do any type of, of uh, you know, a bond finance or any type of research that's just too complex. It's, it's too in depth. And, you know, they sell you a bond based on its rating. They, they never check to see the rating changes. And, and, you know, you're always in trouble long before that happens. So with your bond money, you want to be safe. You want it managed. You want to have individual bonds. You want the highest quality and you want somebody who's watching it every single day. Yeah. Well said, Bob. All right, so we're going to move over to a couple of planning questions and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up for you. You guys have been a great audience. And the first question comes in from Kurt. He writes in, is now the time to pump cash into my Fidelity Roth IRA? I'd say absolutely yes. You know, Roth IRA is money that you can't touch to your 59 and a half. It grows tax-free. You can take it out tax-free. And look, we don't know what the bottom of this market is, but anywhere you buy in here, if it's a long-term investment, I have to think if we're talking two years from now, three years from now, you're going to look back and say, wow, the Dow was at 20, 21,000. Like, I don't care if it went to 18,000 uh, or up to 23,000. It's all going to be really good value. So as a long-term play, I think it's a great time to be investing in that Roth IRA bot for Kurt. Yeah, I think if, you know, you have children or grandchildren, you know, who are working um, and, you know, they, they, they don't look at their 401k, you know, you want to make sure that they're adding money every month into the right asset classes. So, you know, make sure that uh, you, you look at how your contributions are going in. Uh, I've done that for half a dozen people just in the last two weeks. And, uh, you know, this is the time to dollar cost average into assets that are on sale, right? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's bargains. Yeah, you don't need to be exactly right because the opposite of exactly right, I'm going to steal your line here, Bob, is exactly wrong, right? Dollar cost averaging in here being approximately right uh, you're going to be real happy over the next couple of years. So that's the whole idea here is it's, it's kind of like horseshoes and, and hand grenades. You just have to be close to the target. Um, but anyway, I digress. So the next question comes in, comes in from Ron. He writes in, will future RMDs be extended? That's mandatory distributions from your retirement plans, postponed, eliminated, laugh out loud. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be eliminated. Uh, capital gains tax lowered. I don't know anything about the capital gains tax being lowered, but yes, right now, if you have a 401k, 403b, 457 plan or IRA, you can suspend your mandatory distribution this year in 2020 if you're 72 and above. So that's a huge positive that you don't have to take that distribution. It can save you on taxes if you don't necessarily need that money. Um, the other thing is there is no provision that allows someone to put back a distribution taken in 2020. So if you've taken that distribution out already, can't put it back. Um, the other thing is, Americans impacted by the corona crisis can take out up to $100,000 from your IRA or 401k without penalty. The distribution will be subject to normal taxation, but you don't have, if you're younger than 59 and a half, you're not going to be taxed with a penalty on top. Um, and I'm not sure, it's a pretty vague on what those coronavirus crisis criteria are, but I think it's a pretty loose definition. So if you need money before 59 and a half, you can take $100,000 out right now without paying that penalty on top of it. Anything you want to add there, Bob? No, I think the other thing is um, one of the focuses we're going to have over the next year or two is tax planning. You know, the, I'm glad the government's doing what it's doing, but you know who's going to pay for it, right? So, you know, I think one of the things we've got to really be cognizant of is, is to take advantage of every tax strategy we can starting right now. And that would be, you know, do tax swaps in your portfolio, make sure you're making your, your maximum contributions, and if you need money, you, know, you can borrow against your 401k, even though they you know, allow you to take that money out without penalty, still got to pay income tax on it. And then once that money's out, it's not growing tax deferred any longer. So you know, do some tax planning before you just pull the trigger and just yank some money out of any of the account. Yeah, which actually goes right into our next question very nicely. Daniel writes in, would you, would you please explain the benefits and possible risks 
of tax swaps when stocks drop precipitously as they have during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, tax swaps, as you just mentioned, Bob, it's just a great way for the government to cover your losses. So if you can swap out of something in a taxable account, this won't work in your 401ks and IRAs, and go to a like investment, you stay in the market, you don't lose your position here, because as we talked earlier, you never will lose your position in stocks. We don't know when that rally is gonna continue. Um, you can book that loss, you can take $3,000 and deduct it against your ordinary income this year, but you can use those losses until they're used up, you can carry forward them every single year. So let's say you sell a, a, your house next year and you have a big capital gain on that house, um, you're gonna have taxes on it. You can use the losses from your investment portfolio to offset that or any gains you take in the future on your portfolio. It just gives you ultimate flexibility with your losses. It's a good time to do that. It's a good proactive strategy that you can take. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I, I can't you know, agree with that more, Ryan. I, I just wanna say, you know, you can't call a bottom, right? But the risk reward, you know, situation right now, it's most attractive has been in three to four years. You know, price does matter, right? We have a good risk reward um, situation right now. Every bear market I've been through other than, you know, the two crashes, you know, the, the, the markets go down about 35 to, you know, 35%. We've been down 35% already. So, you know, the, the, and it all recovers. Maybe it takes a year or two years, but, you know, think about that. It's not a fat pitch, right? Um, you know, we always look for that fat pitch when investing, but everybody I've ever worked with in my life has said, Bob, if we get a big correction, man, oh man, I just want to take advantage of it. And I said, well, that's what's happening now. Well, I don't want one where I'm so scared. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want a buying opportunity where it's so scary. Um, they're all scary, but you know, if the whole idea is to keep your portfolio balanced. Don't be afraid of, um, you know, adding your portfolio, but please, please don't panic out. Uh, it's the worst thing you could ever do. It's, it's easy to get out, easy to panic out. I don't know anybody's ever panicked in. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Less the panic in when the market was close to a top. That's when you know you're near the top. When everyone wants to get in at the same time, the opportunity is lost. Um, so we'll wrap it up with one last question. I know this is from a client. It's from Dan. And Bob, this is a very serious question, so I want you to be ready for it. All right. He says, Bob, how do you maintain such a beautiful head of hair <laughs> And is it real? We all want to know. <laughs> it's real. And I earned every gray hair. Um, and it just is a, ref it's a small reflection of the, of the scar tissue in my stomach lining that, uh, that, you know, these types of markets do to us. So it's, we all feel the pain, um, you know, and we're all going to, we're all going to get through this together. So, you know, we're available for you 24 seven, call us when you need us. We'll be in touch with you. We'll be, you know, we'll, we'll be proactive in our strategies. Um, I think these are very helpful. They're helpful for us. These questions help us to really focus and hone in on our message and what we're trying to do and challenge our thinking. And, um, you know, I don't know when it's going to end. I don't know what the bottom is, but I know we're closer to the beginning of the end than we are at the beginning of this thing. So fastest decline I've ever seen in history, most wicked volatility. Um, thought I saw it all, you know, probably we'll see something different, but thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we're here to help you and uh, we appreciate you. We really do. Yeah. Likewise, I just want to say thank you very much for, for joining and we're grateful for all of you, especially the ones that are clients on the line. Um, and just to say, yes, we probably have more volatile days ahead, but I'll just emphasize we have a strategy. Uh, this is not our first rodeo. Uh, you know, if you look at the historical markets, and I've said this in the last call, is basically, you know, it doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Um, so, you know, the nice thing is we have an unemotional discipline strategy to get you to your goals and we're going to stick through it through thick and thin i've yet to find another strategy that works better than that and man bob and i have, you know we have the star scar tissue as you like to say bob uh, you know from making the mistakes in the past and we know that a diversified asset allocation works so you know we're going to keep fighting the good fight and we're going to make sure we get you to your goals so thank you very much and everyone have a great night